because we all know, general rule, can't shoot people. General rule. General rule. Sometimes it's okay, though. We're the armed attorneys. Today we're talking about a self-defense case out of our hometown, Houston, Texas, um, that I think is pretty interesting to a wide audience. So we've got self-defense um, of a vehicle, in a vehicle. We've got children involved. It's something I think that probably most parents have thought about. So we're going to talk through the law of this case. We're going to change the facts a little bit for you, talk through alternate scenarios, and hopefully give you a little assistance in thinking about what you would do if this happened to you and your family. But before we get rolling, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And the scenario we're talking about today took place at a family dollar here in Houston, Texas. It was about 8.30 at night. A mother parked her car outside of a family dollar, ran inside to run a quick errand and returned to find a stranger sitting in the driver's side seat with her children inside of the vehicle. An argument or altercation ensued and ended with the mother shooting the perpetrator one time. Uh, The perpetrator currently in custody has been arrested by law enforcement, but it raises a bunch of questions because we have a big, you know, kind of a liberal DA here in Mm -hmm. Harris County, um, and we see so many self-defenders get dragged through the system all the different possible defenses that will probably be raised when this case is presented to a grand jury. And if, you know, we change the facts just slightly, would it change the outcome? Uh, So I think to to start things off, um, good shoot. I I would say so if I were protecting my children. Now, here's this is an interesting because we do have such a liberal prosecutor in Harris County, Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, There were three children in the car. How do you know that all three children were in the back? because they didn't charge the mom. I guarantee if one of her kids had been in the front passenger seat, and we don't know this, the news isn't reporting this, but I know in my heart that if one of those kids had been in the front passenger seat and she shot the front driver, that they would have arrested her and prosecuted her with probably deadly conduct. Yes, and one other thing that came up that we didn't mention earlier is that this uh, the perpetrator in this case was already on police radar. They were already en route to scene because she had busted out another person's window in the roadway. And so um, they kind of have this already lady causing problems. I think that helps a whole lot, too. It sure does. I've talked to people about this a million times before. I mean, let's say you get involved in a self-defense incident. Both parties call police. There's sort of two stories. Does it matter who maybe has had contact with law enforcement before, who is maybe known to be a bad actor? Someone else has called the police on them. Absolutely it does. And that's unfortunate for you if, let's say, you are the self-defender, but you've had some things in your past and you've got a little bit of a record. Is the police officer going to hold it against you if they're looking at your word versus another person's? And the answer is, it's possible. Yeah. And I've had clients where they're repeat self-defenders. They just live in a dangerous Mm -hmm. part of the town and they've had to find themselves in these situations. And uh, police kind of seem to get worn out when it's like, hey, we've uh, you're defended yourself for the sixth time now. So but I think that I think that absolutely helps as well. Now, there isn't just one um, self-defense law at play here. And this is a good illustration for, you know, if you find yourself in one of these scenarios claiming every defense available to what would otherwise be a crime, because we all know general rule can't shoot people. General rule. General rule. Sometimes it's OK, though. And so when we're going through the different defenses, which Which ones jump out at you? Yeah, so I think we've got at least four here from the facts that we know and perhaps more when more facts come out. So I think we can start with, I mean, the biggest player, right, which is castle doctrine. Um, Your state may or may not include your vehicle as your castle. Hopefully you're in a state that does because I think that's a very important protection. But the great state of Texas does include your vehicle as your castle. And we interpret a castle doctrine violation pretty liberally. I mean, it, it is forceful and unlawful entry. And in Texas, forceful entry includes opening an unlocked door, which is what happened here, right? Yes. And on top of that, we have, you know, the occupied Mm -hmm. vehicle. I think that's kind of another critical element um, because, and we'll talk about this alternate scenario, I'd say at the end, what if the vehicle was not occupied? But in the state of Texas and in many states, so long as the vehicle is occupied, your vehicle is occupied, it's going to be considered an extension of your castle. You're going to get all those extra legal protections. And why that's so important is with our multiple layers of self-defense. Now, you know, in most self-defense scenarios, you may find yourself in the situation of having to persuade a jury that what you did was reasonable and immediately necessary. But with Castle Doctrine, we see, you know, it can it falls into two categories. One, it relieves a duty to retreat. But we also see these this other category where it says, 
you have this legal presumption of reasonableness. A jury is to presume that your actions were reasonable and immediately necessary. The state can disprove it, obviously, but we find ourselves on that ladder. Yes. And we actually have another legal defense here. And I want to talk a little bit more about that presumption because I think it's very important. I think it's something that um, lay people don't always wrap their heads around. So we've got another legal defense here, which is that she was defending her children from an aggravated kidnapping. Yep. Now, some states are going to include aggravated kidnapping or kidnapping as an affirmative. It's in your black and white statute that you get to defend when this crime is taking place. Texas does that. But most states, even if they don't say the words kidnapping or aggravated kidnapping, it's included in the self-defense law. You might be defending yourself or someone else against a forcible felony. That's good. very, very common. Yeah, good point. Um, you know, maybe it's just, hey, someone's life is in danger. I mean, if children are being kidnapped, their lives are in danger. You get to, I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to argue that point. No. Um, but we've got, because this is a person crime and it's baked into the law, we've got this legal presumption of reasonableness, which I, I just, think maybe it's because I'm a lawyer and I think these things are interesting and no one else does, but I think it's worth talking about. So when you're just defending without a legal presumption, essentially what your jury is going to do is look and say, was his action reasonable from square one, right? Nothing to tip the scales, just did Richard do the right thing? Let's yeah. discuss. Was it reasonable? Was it immediately necessary? What was the amount of force threatened and how did they respond? Would I have done the same thing, which right. is what they shouldn't be saying, but what they do. Yes. But when you have a legal presumption, which again, many, many states do, some states do not, unfortunately. What you're looking at and what you're looking at here in Texas is, was there an aggravated kidnapping occurring? Was there a violation of the castle occurring? If the answer is yes, that's what the jury is determining. Yep. If the answer is yes, then they are to presume, hence the word legal presumption, presume that you acted reasonably. So they're not saying, should Emily have shot? They're saying, was there, in fact, an aggravated kidnapping in progress? And if the answer is yes, then hypothetically, Emily is not guilty of murder or aggravated assault or attempted murder, whatever I've been charged with for the shooting. Right. Yeah. And the way that I talk to my clients about it is you start at the top of the hill and it's up to the state to kind of knock you off the hill. And they can always disprove a legal presumption of reasonableness. You know, let's say you're inside of your house and Somebody kicks down your door, you shoot them, you know, you'd get that legal presumption. But let's say they discover some text messages where you say, hey, uh, my door's stuck. Will you come help me, you know, break it loose? Well, then obviously you're not allowed to shoot people. She comes out of the family dollar and it's a 10-year-old little girl sitting in the driver's seat who's right. just gotten in to talk to her kids. It, reasonable to shoot under the castle doctrine? Of course not. That's no. going to be disproven. So we have, you know, first we have our forceful and unlawful entry into the occupied vehicle mm -hmm. of the castle. We have our aggravated kidnapping. There's probably a few other defenses here. I'd say burglary. Burglary, right? I mean, that's just, you know, breaking and entering, right? It's a very common way to think about that. Yep. But, you know, you forcefully and unlawfully enter some sort of container, right? You can burglarize all sorts of things, homes, um, buildings, office parks, vehicles. Mm -hmm. In Texas, you can burglarize coin-operated machines, lots of states criminalize specific burglary of yeah. rail cars, things like that. So if you are essentially breaking into a structure, that's burglary. Yeah. The other ones that might come up and we don't have all the facts just yet in Texas is one of the few states that has this bizarre law about theft in the nighttime. Nighttime. Which is 30 minutes after sunset, 30 minutes before sunrise. Your self-defense rights, for whatever reason, change in the state of Texas if you're defending against a theft and a criminal mischief. Those two might come up as well. Right. Absolutely. And really, you know, when this case goes to the grand jury, which it will, as bizarre as that seems to a lot of people, of course, she was defending her children. Most large counties in the United States will not let shootings go unpresented to a grand jury, yeah. which is scary because defense attorneys have no access to the grand jury. Um, you have to hope and pray the grand jury d does the right thing and hope and pray that the prosecutor is encouraging a no bill because really, I mean, and we know this from having been prosecutors, a grand jury is pretty likely to just do what the prosecutor tells them. They're relying yeah. heavily on the prosecutor. As much as you wouldn't want it to be that way. I mean, I've indicted 10 cases in less than five minutes. I mean, right. it's really... It can be very, very quick, and it's not as, you know, intense as you may want it to be. And my opinion about this has changed a little bit recently about presenting these cases to grand jury. I'm actually, I actually kind of like the idea now. I'm kind of moving over to the idea of it's a good idea to get these cases no build so that they can't be reopened later. You don't have a potential murder charge hanging over your head for the rest of your life. But 
That's fair. As long as the defense has an opportunity to participate. Exactly right? right. You know, most of the time we do that as defense attorneys through written material, through packets. It's not as good as being there in person, but it's the best we can do. Yeah. Now let's change the scenario just slightly. No kids in the car. Do you think that changes the calculus? Because I, I think it does. A hundred percent. I mean, first of all, I think a kid in the front seat changes the calculus, yep, right? Yep. Um, but a 100 percent, no children in the car. What we have is someone trying to commit a property crime against you. Yeah. And I get that question a lot from folks. Hey, you know, I'm in my house. I hear a noise outside. I look out. I see someone breaking into my unoccupied keyword, unoccupied vehicle at the end of my driveway. I think we can kind of equate the two. And I think the advice generally would be the same in both of those scenarios. Yeah. And bear in mind that, you know, we have in this first scenario, we have those four potential legal defenses. You have just that unoccupied vehicle. We've whittled it down to two. Burglary of a motor vehicle, theft in the nighttime. Yeah. No aggravated kidnapping. No, it's no, no longer a castle. Person crimes. Yeah. Right. So we're out of that world in which it's, oh, well, there was a burglary occurring. That means it was reasonable. No, no, no. And this is where you're going to find yourself in virtually every state if you're just defending property. Some states won't let you do it at all. No. Right? But you're going to find yourself in this world of, you know, from square one, convince me that you're reasonable. Yeah, no legal presumptions. No. And if you get an anti-gun jury, if the jury just doesn't like you, I mean, I've had clients who did the right thing, but they just weren't that likable. And it's an up, it's an uphill battle. No, you know? it, it really is. And, you know, that's where we just fall back to good self-defense principles. Juries like people over things if it's just a property crime. And these situations can be dynamic. You know, you see somebody breaking into your car, they turn, they have something in their hands. Okay, well, maybe now it's just not the vehicle. Right. Maybe you're in danger. You're so, in danger. But let's, let's just assume it's the car. You know, the, the only thing in, uh, in danger is the car. A lot of people want to see, hey, are there reasonable safe alternatives to going and engaging this person? You know, what's the level of force in response to, you know, it, the proportionality mix when it comes to defending property looks kind of bizarre when it comes to force or deadly force. And so generally that's one of those situations that I tell my clients to avoid. Uh, me too. You know, that's, uh, you know, I think, and I think we get a little bit of heat for telling people not to engage in self-defense, yeah. you know, like those lawyers don't believe in my right self-defense. Of course we do. That's the most important right that we have is to protect our own lives and our family's lives. But you have to remember that we are and we are actively in the courtroom defending people who are looking at 99 years in prison. So we are always going to say you know, your self-defense is critically important. Your gun rights are critically important. You win every fight you avoid, right? right? And the, as just as defense attorneys, we're going to fall back on that. If you can make a, you know, claim on your stolen vehicle and not go to prison for murder, right? that's ideal. Yeah, I, I was talking to a former client this morning who uh, we walked him through an aggravated assault charge in, in Harris County. And he had a new situation come up this morning that was just a trespasser. And did he respond properly? And um, you know, I was kind of going through exactly what you said. And he's like, man, I do not want to go and go back through the system. No. Because even even if you win, you lose. But exactly. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And always question and comment for us below. Until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys.